In this session, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the history of payment and financing in the U.S. healthcare system. So this is a very quick pass over about 80 years of history uh, in the U.S. healthcare system. And I'll look both at events that changed coverage for healthcare, payment for healthcare, uh, and expanded uh, access to care for consumers. So in this timeline, uh, I'm just highlighting major events, and then I'm going to go through some of the themes of these changes, which are not altogether monotonic. So it's not that the system is evolving in a single direction, but very frequently we see advances and retreats. The piece of history where we're going to start a conversation about how the U.S. healthcare system has evolved is World War II. In World War II, there were price freezes that were put into place by the government. And so when employers wanted to recruit the few remaining workers that were available, uh, they had to use something else. And what they used was an offer of health insurance. And around this time, health insurance became more valuable to workers and others because hospitals became more expensive, treatments became more expensive. So this is a big part of enhanced access. Uh, over time, the demand for health insurance increased, and during the 1960s, in particular as part of the war on poverty, the government recognized that it needed to step in and play a bigger role in providing health insurance for indigent populations. A, a big group there was the elderly at the time, Poverty among the elderly was deeply connected to health care issues. And so Medicare and Medicaid came into being. Uh, further, as expanded coverage really took place in the US and many more groups of people were able to access health insurance, uh, the question of cost control became more and more salient. And so a number of reforms went into effect in the 70s and 1980s that really addressed this. So health maintenance organizations were an early form of managed care that tried to use some tools to increase the value of the way healthcare dollars were being deployed, but also put some breaks on the growing cost of healthcare. Uh, at the same time, Medicare now uh, established as a federal program faced challenges in terms of hospital payment. And so we saw a big hospital payment reform, the DRG system, in the 1980s. Next, there was a move to uh, evolve managed care and turn over some of the responsibility for controlling costs to physicians. And so in the 1990s, there was the rise of capitated payment for physicians. I'll put all these pieces together in a little bit more logic in the subsequent slides. Uh, but all of this is really about trying to find the right way to balance improved access to health care, cost control, and maintenance or improvement of the quality of care. And so the quality of care story uh, really comes into effect a bit later. Capitation payment was about controlling cost, and uh, there were concerns that that went too far, that people weren't getting access to needed care. And we saw the managed care backlash of the late 1990s, followed by an emphasis on payment for improving quality, pay for performance. Next, uh, there was again a, a return to some previous ideas that, in fact, we should do less in terms of getting the delivery system to control costs and worry about questions of access, and really we should place more responsibility on consumers. So health savings accounts, consumer-directed health care came into being in around 2003 with the Medicare Modernization Act. And of course, we'll talk a lot about the Affordable Care Act of 2010, the goal of which was to essentially universalize access to health insurance and at the same time to begin to make systematic changes in the delivery system to provide better value. So just again, to put some logic around this, going back to that notion of demand and supply, these are the two major levers that policymakers can pull. On the demand side, uh, policymakers could expand coverage. That, of course, will increase the demand for health care. Uh, and then they can balance that with cost sharing. For example, higher out-of-pocket payments for emergency department use might get consumers to trade off in ways that reduced emergency department use increased primary care. Uh, and um, the managed care revolution was really about changing the shape of health care delivery in terms of forming networks of providers and encouraging coordination among those providers. So uh, something outside of cost sharing, but still really affecting the way patients seek care. 
On the supply side, the changes that I mentioned often had to do with both the level of payment but also the way that providers are paid. So providers could be paid per service, they could be paid for a global episode of care, or reimbursement can be set for the entire population. All of these payment mechanisms can be combined with other command and control efforts, uh, such as prior authorization. A, a physician can't be reimbursed for a high cost procedure or test until they've been approved by the insurance company. So these describe uh, the progress of US health policy in terms of, again, increasing access, but at the same time, managing cost and quality. So on the demand side now, what have we mostly seen? In general, we've seen that the over time there was an increased demand for health insurance coverage because of the new capabilities, the greater expense of health care. And at the same time, while expanding to new populations, payers, both employers and private insurance companies, as well as the government, recognize the need to have some control over total cost and frequently use elements of coverage both the extent of coverage, but also cost sharing and requirements, for example, to go to your primary care physician before seeing a subspecialist to control cost. Uh, managed care likewise use many other kinds of mechanisms, many of which we continue to see today. Uh, so for example, it may be that patients have much more ready access to low cost services than high cost services. They have a smaller network, for example, of choices for very high cost services. On the supply side, the main theme of the U.S. health policy changes that I mentioned earlier has been really about the prospectiveness of payment, uh, as well as uh, the extent to which quality and outcomes are considered as part of payment, which we'll get into to a much greater extent later. Uh, at the, at the left side of my chart, at the far end, uh, we see cost-based reimbursement where uh, providers can bill anything they deem reasonable, payers ba pay based on, on those reported costs. That, of course, is very inflationary in terms of total spending. Over time, payers both in the private and public sector have tried to focus on more global payments, more prospective payments, uh, first by setting a standard fee schedule and then by moving towards, uh, for physicians in large organizations, salaried payment. For hospitals, so-called DRGs, diagnosis-related groups, which pay for the entire episode of an inpatient admission. And finally, in the current era and in the 1990s, the idea of capitation or global payment has a great deal of appeal because it sets a total budget that a provider must manage to. So as we look at the history of U.S. health policy concerning financing and payment, uh, we can see that there's this path dependence of the way policy has evolved with the goal of increasing access, increasing health, uh, but also the understanding that as we do that, uh, the consequence is greater spending year over year, healthcare spending has grown more rapidly than the economy, and so mechanisms for cost control, each of which uh, has a different emphasis on consumers versus providers, uh, have evolved over time. And as we look at the system today, it's influenced by all all of these factors, benefit design, payment, the structure of coverage, all of those come into play in what we get in terms of the organization of the system and the outcomes.